the railroad was a very important part of Antigo's history. If it weren't for the railroad, Antigo would have never really developed as the city it would become. The first train to come into Antigo was operated by the Milwaukee, Lakeshore and Western Railroad. And here's a picture of it arriving at the original Antigo Depot. And the, uh, the, rail the Milwaukee, Lakeshore and Western came to Antigo because of the efforts of De La Glees. Francis De La Glees was the first resident of what would eventually become Antigo. And in 1880, he encouraged the Milwaukee, Lakeshore and Western Railroad to expand through Antigo. The rail line went as far as Eland, and they were looking to expand, and he convinced them that they should uh, build their line going through Antigo. He owned a lot of property in Antigo, and he recognized that if the railroad came here, uh, it would increase the importance of Antigo in commercial development. So here is the typical survey crew uh, expanding the railroad line, trying to figure out where best is, uh, where the best grade is, uh, avoiding hills and anything that would be complicating to the building of the railroad. And here is the first locomotive to pull into the Antigo Depot. It came in on August 15, 1880. And when it came in, uh, there were sandwiches and lemonade served. Um, Antigo, because of the efforts of Francis de la Glise, was a very uh, temperate-oriented uh, city. Uh, he, uh, de la Glise strongly disapproved of alcohol and while well, some people wanted to have champagne or something special for the train pulling into the station, he insisted on nothing stronger than lemonade. And here is the original depot, uh, as it was in the 1880s, when it was the Milwaukee, Lakeshore and Western. Then in 1883, the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad took over the Milwaukee, Lakeshore and Western. So it was now the Chicago Northwestern and that's when the railroad really took off as an important part of Antico's history. In 1907 uh, they expanded the railroad line uh, depot and Antico became the district headquarters for the Chicago Northwestern. Uh, so um, what that meant is anybody traveling from Milwaukee to Minneapolis or from Madison up to the Ashland or the UP um, or from Green Bay to Minneapolis, this is where you came to change trains. And this is where the crew lived that would go out on trips to repair bridges, rail lines, all through northern Wisconsin. And this is where they brought their locomotives for, and uh, rail cars for repairs. Uh, this is where they had an ice house. Uh, ice was cut out of Antigo Lake and stored and then used uh, by the railroad to air condition railroad cars, uh, passenger cars, and to uh, refrigerate produce cars. Um, all over uh, northern Wisconsin, rail cars were cooled by ice that came from Antigo Lake and stored at the um, Antigo Rail Yards. Altogether there were about 10 city blocks worth of buildings uh, that were all related to the railroad and in, it's estimated that in the 1940s uh, uh, more than half, maybe close to 70 percent of all families in Antigo had somebody working for the railroad in the family. Oops. So when they built a new depot, they put the old depot on a, tr on a cart, a track, and they hauled it up the street a few blocks and it became a workshop where they did repair work on some of the passenger cars. And this is the carpenter shop which had been the old depot. I mentioned the ice house. The ice house was so important 
that there's a company that makes model kits for people who uh, are uh, electric train hobbyists. And they built an ice house uh, for people who like to build these, uh, these uh, kits. And um, they use the Antigo ice house as a model for, uh, for this kit that they marketed. This is a little bit uh, in its final days as an ice house, but this is what it looked like. It's a little bit disrepaired. It doesn't look as spectacular as the uh, picture you see on the label of the, of the kit. And uh, I mentioned that, um, that it was where they bought, brought their engines for repairs. And, and uh, these are just some of the views of the rail yard. Uh, and uh, what made Antico uh, the rail hub it was. This is from the roof of the courthouse. And uh, you can see looking north that, that there's right here is a huge roundhouse. And this was, you would uh, run the train into there and it would be on a turntable. They could rotate it do repair work and send it back out. But you can see this is from the courthouse and these were these were all buildings or workshops related to the railroad and it went all the way down from uh, this is probably well north of First Avenue all the way down to 10th Avenue. Here's an aerial view of the uh, roundhouse and you see on the right all these rail cars lined up as part of the tracks. Uh, Antico, uh, it was as I mentioned earlier, it was a major railroad hub, and one of the things they talked about is um, is that uh, high noon in Antico in 1907, there's a train that went northbound and a train that came southbound. And they would both pull into the uh, Antigo Depot at around noon. Uh, the crew, they would change crews. They would do some touch-up on the engines, maybe refill the, the uh, water tanks. And, uh, and then the people would go to a restaurant to have lunch. And so starting in early 1900s, for the next 40 years, the northbound train, the northbound train, and the southbound train would each arrive in Antigo at noon. They would have about an hour for lunch, and then they would take off again on their um, route. Antigo advertised itself as the gateway to the Northwoods, or gateway to vacation country. And the Chicago Northwestern had special lines that would come up from Antigo up into the uh, northern part of Wisconsin and into the upper peninsula of Michigan uh, for vacationers and this was an all-season thing including hunting season. In um, the uh, Flambeau 400 was one of the luxury trains that they introduced for going up north and it was called the 400 because it traveled 400 miles in 400 minutes. The Flambeau 400 went from Chicago to Ashland and it connected to Watersmeet in the summertime. And here is a uh, picture from a postcard that was promoting the uh, Flambeau 400 and it shows the dining car with the passengers traveling in luxury. Here's just another view of a publicity shot of the Flambeau 400. This was the menu that was in the dining car. And here you see some of the uh, uh, choices. The special dinner was $2.85. And here's the a la carte uh, dinner. Um, Lake Superior Trout, a dinner was $1.50. This was back in the, uh, I think, 1930s and 1940s. 
the depot in Antigo was a site for many special events. And here is a, uh, there was a convention in Antigo of the M&M and &M, um, &M excursion. And uh, they would come to Antigo and here was a civic band coming to greet the people. Another, another special event, for example, was a, a German choir, there was a, uh, a convention of German choirs. Uh, Wisconsin had a large German population, German immigrants. And one year in 1907, they had a big convention in Antigo. And when they came into town, Again, they were greeted by the town folks and uh, band. July 4th uh, was a common, uh, there was always a July 4th parade, and generally at the depot is where the floats and the people would assemble for the beginning of the parade. And then they would go down Fifth Avenue and uh, around town. Here, here's just another convention that took place in uh, Antigo of the Wisconsin Livestock Breeders Association. They came with special cars for their cattle to uh, meet at this convention in Antigo. And again, they were greeted at the depot with the town, by the townsfolks. Um, uh, seeing troops off to war, this is World War I. Uh, soldiers trained in Antigo and then they they assembled at the depot where they were being shipped out. In this case they were going to another place in Wisconsin for further training and the uh, the uh, townsfolk came out to uh, wish them well. This was the 107th Trench Mortar Battery Company it was called and it was a special force made up of recruits mostly from Antigo but from rural Langley County as well. And here in World War II, again soldiers uh, being seen off by family members at the depot. Uh, the railroad made logging possible in the Antigo Flats. In the early days of logging, most of the logging camps occurred near the Wolf River. Logs with the pine trees would mostly, mostly pine trees, would be cut and floated down to mills further downstream. Pine would float. <clears throat> but as those uh, forests near the Wolf River thinned out, um, logging was no longer practicable near the Wolf River or some of the other rivers around. And uh, but the railroads by then were coming in, and in um, <clears throat> and then it was possible to cut logs and ship them to lumber mills by rail. Around the years uh, around World War One and the 19 teens, uh, uh, 50 to 60 cars of logs would come into Antigo and head to the local sawmills. And this map is a little hard to see, but these were all these little spur rail uh, lines. Sometimes a, a, a short line would go to a logging camp and then would hook up to the main line. And then when those woods were depleted, uh, they would tear up the tracks and establish another uh, line somewhere else to another logging camp. And these, these uh, went from about the 19 teens into the 1940s, you would see uh, locking uh, railroad spur lines. Here's just a, um, a couple of views of a train from the Payne Lumber Company, which was near Bass Lake, hauling a load of logs from uh, an area into a um, sawmill in Antigo. Antigo had a number of sawmills that de uh, depended on logs from the area. The Crocker Chair Company 
they were one of the major uh, logging companies in the area and they even had their own train uh, line. Uh, I don't know if you can see the engine markings on this, it said CC Company. It was the Crocker Chair Company. That was in the Crocker Hills around uh, around Polar or Elton. And uh, the area is still to this day called the Crocker Hills. The other um, use of the railroad uh, for uh, non-passenger but for freight are what they called reefer cars, which stood for refrigerator. And uh, uh, produce, farm produce, was shipped in special refrigerated cars. This one was a major potato grower in Langlade County, Felix Zelowski, and he had his own railroad cars. A lot of the other farmers, potato farmers, would ha rent their uh, cars, but uh, Zel Zelowski was prominent enough that he had his own supply of personal rail cars. During the peak years in the 1940s of produce shipping by rail, at least 2,000 reefer cars went out of Antigo each year carrying mostly potatoes. Uh, this I find interesting. This is a fish car. Uh, little trout were raised, trout fry, in uh, fish hatcheries in Madison and they were shipped on special cars arranged to have, they had aquaria in them to keep these little fish and this one, the picture you see here, the, the uh, fish car has arrived at the Antigo Depot and then it's being loaded in using these big metal milk cans into pickup trucks and from there they were being driven out to lakes and streams in the area to stock uh, lakes with fish, including Pence Lake. Okay. The Chicago North Northwestern ran special trains uh, for the fishermen. Uh, from came out of Chicago from 1917 to 1950. They raised these special trains. They would leave Chicago and uh, ride up to uh, the Upper Peninsula or northern Wisconsin and, uh, and they, they ran them all summer from May 1st until Memorial Day and from Labor Day to October 1st they ran them on weekends but during the summer months Memorial Day to Labor Day they operated daily except for Monday so trains would bring fishermen north uh, on the, uh, one day and then a the couple days later they would bring them back home to Chicago and they had a special baggage car uh, refrigerated for people to bring their fish back. And here you see some Ojibwe fishing guides uh, taking fishermen off to lakes and for the Ojibwe uh, around, mostly around La Lac de Flambeau and northern Wisconsin into the UP. They made a pretty good living acting as fishing guides. The last train to leave Antigo was a privately owned coach and was hooked up to a freight train and it took a group of people from Antigo to an area around Mercer for a fishing, a fishing outing. Uh, and this was in 1981, but uh, Antigo's prominence as a rail depot started to decline in the early 50s. It used to be that um, in the days of steam locomotives, this was a major uh, center. This is where they brought their engines for repairs, um, but when, with the advent of diesel, uh, the Chicago Northwestern took its locomotives elsewhere and so Antigo began to lose its prominence and by 1957 steam engines were no longer used and that was the last steam engine to pull out of Antigo. Here's another view of the special trains that they ran in the fall for hunters. They, again they would 
run, the Chicago Northwestern ran special trains out of Antigo up further north for deer hunters and then they would have special refrigerated cars for the people to bring their deer back to uh, Chicago. I don't know, can we skip these? I don't think they're going to show up on a... Well, you'll edit this. Yeah. Um, they, this is hard to see, but this is available online and at the museum. These maps that show that Antigo itself, from about 10th Avenue up to well north of the courthouse, uh, was just lined with one building after another related to the... Uh, to the railroad. These, this is where they brought car, passenger cars, uh, engines for repairs. Uh, they had a huge ice house to refrigerate cars. This was all ice that was stocked out of Antigo Lake. And so here you just see, you can barely make it out on this view, but of all the buildings that were associated with the railroad. It was by far the biggest employee in Antigo. And by the 1980s, uh, railroad was no longer part of uh, the economy of Antigo. Uh, all the tracks were torn up, all the buildings related to the railroad were gone. The only building that remained was the depot itself and uh, it still stands. The depot was remodeled so in 1991 a project was undertaken to remodel the depot and repurpose it for a commercial and residential building. And here it is today and um, it, it basically looks the same as as it did in its glory days as a depot, and you can tell that it's the same building. And before the depot was changed, uh, somebody uh, made a model of the depot, and here it is, so there's a scale model of the depot as it was when, uh, when it was uh, used as a depot. And this model now sits also sitting in the uh, museum. And a lot of this information comes from a book, a book that a magazine article of the Chicago Northwestern Historical Society's magazine. And that book is called the special issue devoted to the Antigo Depot was called 55 Minutes for Lunch. That's because the northbound train and the southbound train met in Antigo at noon and the train stopped, the crew changed, uh, they cleaned up things and meanwhile the passengers had 55 minutes to go out to eat or shop downtown. And this article, this magazine article, is available from the museum's website and at the museum. And most of the photographs in this uh, presentation come from that magazine. That's the end. Okay, this one's done.